All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, JJ talk to us today about the arithmetic directory. So take it away, JJ. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, so today we're talking about the arithmetic direction. So let me start with the, the quick outline. So the first thing we'll do is we'll give you an intro to the Cartesian plane. Then we're going to define uh, rings and ideals. And then we'll talk about the perfectoid correspondence and deformation theory. Um, so in the before times, that is to say 2018, um, all there was was Euclidean geometry. So the way Euclidean geometry works is you have axioms about things like you know points whoops oh dear here I meant to here we go I meant to touch it with my with my uh, uh, with my pen I got it with my finger but anyways um, you you have axioms about points and lines and the axioms are constructive like you like like Euclid you could, you, you do like uh, compass and straight edge constructions. And that will give you the, you know, if you have two points, like one of the axioms I think is if you have two points, right? You can draw a line between them. And, you know, there's, there's like compass and straight edge constructions like that will give you those two axioms. And then, you know, you do Euclidean geometry, you prove things using the axioms. Um, it's very visual um and it's constructive and um this is what this is what people did geometry with uh for a long time um but a, a long time later in march of 2020 um rene descartes uh, a french mathematician had an idea that would would kind of change the way we do geometry and really um really, really have a, a big effect on, you know, calculus would be uh, discovered slash invented uh, just very quickly after this. Um, and so Ren what Rene Descartes idea was, was the Cartesian plane. Um, okay. And so Descartes idea is we're going to use numbers rather than just like doing these constructions with shapes and compasses and straight edges we're actually going to assign you know if you're talking about the plane two numbers to every single point right and then we have our our coordinate lines um right the coordinate lines are going to tell us like you know they're they're going to tell us what point is zero um, I guess, basically. And so, so you know, these, these coordinate, they're, they're, it's kind of arbitrary what, what lines you choose to be the coordinate lines. That's, you know, you know, you're talking about like vector spaces and bases and stuff like that. But um, the point of the Cartesian plane is that you have numbers now. And, and somehow without this Cartesian plane idea, which fun fact was also, um, Descartes was not the only person who came up, up with this. Fermat also, also came up with it, but he didn't publish it. Um, so yeah, you can, you can look that up on Wikipedia if you want to. But um, the, the uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Somehow the importance of having numbers uh, here can't be overstated. Um, and so the, 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 so, so some advantage of this, of this. Um, so all of a sudden now you can think about four dimensional space because you just take four numbers. Um, it sounds like, okay, someone needed to mute. Now they're muted. Um, but the, okay. So the point was n dimensional space, um, right? I can just take if I, if I want to have a four dimensional point, I just take a four tuple. Um, and now we can think about four dimensional manifolds or something without having to 
without having to really say anything about, or without having to picture it, right? Whereas with Euclidean geometry, you really had to picture it. Um, and you can do things like graph functions, right? Um, and, and the real, uh, at least from my perspective, as somebody who studies algebraic geometry, is Descartes construction lets us turn geometry into algebra. So in particular, if we have um, something, if we have a shape like this circle, which you can construct using, uh, using a, a straight edge and a, and a compass, right? Um, now, using Descartes' idea, this, this circle, you have an equation, which is in particular, this equation right here, x squared plus y squared equals four. And that equation is completely algebraic. You can plug numbers in and, and sort of um, manipulate it completely algebraically, but it describes this shape. So we're already, we're, we're using algebra to describe geometry. And the power of algebra is that you don't need to think about the geometry to do the algebra. Um, Okay, so um, so now we're gonna fast forward in our sort of tour through the history of geometry. Um, so Cartesian coordinates are still great. Um, they're used for lots of things. Um, I guess somehow somehow in in manifold theory we're still somehow using uh, Cartesian coordinates if you think about what what manifolds are. Um, for people who know what manifolds are. Um, sort of the defining property of a manifold is that locally it looks like Rn or locally it has some coordinates. Um, so we, deal, we, we, we still do use these, but uh, in, in recent times, more recent times, uh, about May to August of around, around 2020, um, um, people have started, or actually no, I think this is supposed to be 2021. Um, around May to August of 2021, um, people have started moving away from Cartesian coordinates, especially in algebraic geometry. And so there are lots of people who are behind this, um, like Zariski, uh, Grotendieck, uh, and Serre. And so right now, I want to sort of describe uh, a little bit. What's that? Oh, yeah, we were wondering if the dates were solipsistic. If they're, they're what? Solipsistic, based upon one's own perception of reality. Did, um, you, did you start doing algebraic geometry in May to August of 2021? Um, no, no, I think, I think they might just be, uh, um, they might be off by a, a factor of a constant or something, but, but don't uh, worry. Um, they'll end up generating the same deal, uh, so it's fine. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and for people who don't know what ideals are, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so, but yes, so anyway, I want to introduce us to how this sort of new perspective on what geometry is, um, as opposed to the Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so this is the modern philosophy that um, I think a lot of people in geometry try to use, is we want to, rather than thinking about things in terms of points, um, we want to think about things in terms of functions. Okay, so how is that gonna work? Um, so if I go back to my example of the circle here, right, I have, an equation right here that I wrote down, which is x squared plus y squared equals four. Um, and that equation defines this circle right here. Um, so what I can do now is I can make this equation, well, if I, I, if I just sort of um, subtract the four, bring it to the other side, then I have, this right here, 
which is uh, it's a function. And now my, my space is defined by taking the zero set of that function. So this is, this is how things are done a lot of the time in algebraic geometry is we, rather than you know, thinking about the equations, rather than actually thinking about polynomials, we think about functions. And then we know that our, our shapes, our circles are going to be the zero sets of these functions. Um, so it's sort of, we're sort of, we're sort of taking a slightly more indirect approach than just, you know, having a collection of points here. And the advantage is that this is going to be more flexible. Um, so let's 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 have some definitions. Um, so a shape. So a shape is a zero set of uh, some set of functions, right? Um, I, I guess I could say some set of functions. And so for us, uh, because we want to be visual and we want to be able to picture stuff, we're gonna think about shapes which are embedded in two dimensional space. And so the, the comment that I'll make here is that when mathematicians say something is two dimensional, what they mean is it's locally two dimensional. It's locally isomorphic to a two dimensional space. But when, um, when a normal person says two dimensional, they mean something that's embedded in two dimensional space. So right now we're thinking about shapes in the normal, in the non-mathematician sense of being embedded in that dimensional space. And so the way we're gonna define it is we're gonna take some functions um, and we're gonna take the simultaneous zero set, right? So that that's like, you know, f um, i of x, y equals zero. So, right, so maybe I should write it like this, like um, f1 equals zero, which equals f2 of x, y equals dot, dot, dot equals fn of x, y. Um, right, so I am, I am, taking the set of points, which is going to be the zero set of all of these simultaneously. Um, and the reason I'm doing it simultaneously is because that's gonna be a slightly more flexible than just having a single function. Um, and so now what our job is going to be is to find a characterization of shapes in terms of just the, in terms of just the functions. Um, and so right now we're only gonna consider polynomial shapes, i.e. all of our functions, all of our F1, F2 up to Fn are going to be uh, polynomials. Um, and, and that's sort of the hallmark of algebraic geometry, but there are other areas where you can think of functions as different things um, and still do stuff like this. Oh, uh oh, okay. So let's make some observations. So first of all is that some polynomials are going to give us the same shape. Um, so, okay, what does that, what, what does that mean? So that means, so if I have, so right now I've drawn a picture of the graph y equals x squared, right? Um, and so if I want to make this into a function, I have to, you know, bring things to one side and then, so but the function that I would use is x squared minus y. Okay. And so now what I'm saying here is if this thing is zero, certainly that's the same thing as if I square it, it's gonna be zero because right, um, x squared equals zero is the same thing as saying, you know, x equals zero. Ah, my, my equal sign is a little messy, but you get the idea. Um, and I mean, the same will be true for x cubed and x to the fourth. So, so we even have an infinite family of, you know, a bunch of different functions that can all define the same shape. 
So that's the first observation we'll make. Um, so another observation we can make is if we multiply two functions, then we union the, the zero sets. So that's, you know, that's just a consequence of what I sometimes uh, like to refer to as the duh theorem, right? If x uh, times y equals zero, then that means x equals zero or y equals zero, right? Um, and so what that, you know, what that comes out visually is, is right here where, you know, this is x equals zero, the y-axis. This is y equals zero, the x-axis. And when x is equal to zero or y is equal to zero, well, that's just the unit. We get the, the uh, infinitely extending plus sign. Okay. Um, another observation. Oop, did my slide change? Oh, there it is. Um, when we add an extra function to the list, uh, then that's taking the intersection. Um, so, right, so let's say I have a function x minus three, that's a vertical line like this. The function y minus four is a horizontal line like this. And then the point three, four, in my two space is going to be the zero set of both of these functions simultaneously, right? Because if you think about it, y minus four equals zero equals x minus three. Well, that's just the same thing as saying y equals four and x equals three, right? So I'm the, the arithmetic is quite basic. The geometry is quite pictorial, but I want to phrase everything in terms of function. Okay, um, a couple more things. I, there's like, there's like, there's like a, one or two more visual observations that I want to make. Um, and so the, okay, so the first, well, the next one is um, if we add two things and they vanish somewhere, the sum of them is still going to vanish there. So the, the example that I have written out here is the, the function x is vanishes on the y actor. Actually, oh, I did that picture wrong, didn't I? Because it's actually going to vanish on the, on the y axis, not the x axis. Whoops. But anyways. Um, kind of the same diff. Um, and then x squared is going to vanish exactly when x vanishes, because that's how squared works. So the vanishing set will be the same. And then when I add them and I factor this, I see that this is x times 1 plus x. So that's going to vanish here, where x vanishes. And then when I multiply two things I union and one plus X will vanish right here when X equals minus one. Um, so the, the sum of them, it's a, it ends up being a union of these two lines right here. Um, but the important thing is this union contains the original thing. And so that's the point. Um, that's the point about uh, this remark here. Um, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, uh, are there any quick questions? Okay. Um, and then I, yeah, I think this is the last one. Yeah, okay. The If we multiply a function by anything, its vanishing set will only grow. So if we take Oh, what's a good function? Something like um, x squared plus, or no, let me let me do an easy one. Um, well, okay, maybe maybe this 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do an easy one. Just x squared. Um, how do I erase? Here we go. So f of x, y equals x squared, right? And the picture is, you know, it vanishes at this y-axis. And then I, I can multiply that by something, by anything, right? Now I wanna do x squared times y. Um, and because of the thing I said earlier about unions, when we, when we take the union, when we multiply two things, we take the union of their vanishing sets. Um, the vanishing set of X is definitely contained in this union. So this is, just a, this is just a simple consequence of the union thing. And so this vanishing set, um, this vanishing set will be the, the, the infinite extending plus again. Okay. So throughout here, um, throughout all of these sort of pictorial things that I've been showing, um, we've made a lot of use of the fact that functions aren't just functions. They're things that we can add and subtract and multiply, particularly add and multiply. And this is kind of, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I chose functions that are going to be polynomials. I mean, you can do this with other types of functions. E to the X isn't a polynomial, but you can still add and multiply it. But um, particularly polynomials are, um, like we know we can add and subtract and multiply them and they will remain polynomials. Um, um, you know, if we want to define a class of functions that has e to the x in it, and we want to, you know, add and multiply and remain in that class, it might take a little bit of thinking. Um, and there are a couple of different options. But polynomials are, you know, we can add and multiply them, and they're still polynomials. And so this, the concept that, um, that generalizes this is called a ring. And so the important thing about the definition of ring is that a ring is a set which acts like the polynomial function. And I really think that this somehow is um, the, somehow this is like, somehow this is a fundamental thing. Like um, when, we, when, we, when we do something, there's a construction called the free ring. Um, and the free ring is sort of like a, a fundamental sort of smallest type of ring that you can make um, given a certain input. And so I'm not gonna go into the construction of the free ring, but the free ring turns out to be a polynomial ring. And so somehow polynomial rings are fundamental to what, um, to what rings are. And so I can, I mean, I can, um, and of course I can define precisely what a ring is. Um, so for it, it, something to act sufficiently like the polynomials, um, I have to have a multiplication, I have to have an addition, and I have to have a negation map. And there are some axioms that I can write out in terms of commutative diagrams or something. And, of course, as always, a ring need not have uh, an inversion map. But the, but the important thing is that rings act like polynomials. Um, and then, so if we're going to characterize um, our shapes, let's see. Oh, interesting. Um, so, Given our function, so 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 we we given a function, we can get a shape, and we did that a bunch. But given just a zero set, you know, given something that's going to look like, you know, our circle, how do we come back 
on the other side and get a function. Um, well, first of all, we already know that this isn't unique because uh, we can keep taking powers. Um, and then there are some shapes like, like the point that we described. And it turns out that this, this point, you can't, you can't come up with it by taking the zero set of a single function. You actually have to use multiple functions. And of course, I didn't prove that, but you can prove this. Um, and um, so the way, so, so, so there, if we just want to take a shape and come up with a function, there are some issues. But the idea here is other than these issues that, that sometimes we're going to need more than one function and there's a lack of uniqueness. Um, with with respect to like having powers, um, that's those are kind of the only problems that we have to deal with. And once we can do that, we can kind of recover the shape from just the function, and it's going to be functions plural. Um, and so the trick that we'll use is just to consider all of the possible functions which do vanish on the set. And so. You know, if we consider all possible functions, if, if we have two things that vanish on the set, um, this, we have this, we add them and, um, right, when we add them, it can only increase the, it can only increase the zero set. And also, if I have something that vanishes on the set and, you know, something else, um, I multiply them together. And again, multiplying, taking the union can only increase the zero set. So adding and multiplying um, are sort of somehow closed uh, in here. And so this, this leads us to the concept of an ideal. And so again, an ideal, and I think this is, this is again, from this perspective, this is the somewhat fundamental thing. Um, an ideal is a set which acts like it's the set of functions which vanish on a shape on a on a shape. So ideals, really, I want to think of these as and, and so if you're if you're in the business, um, um, yeah, shape, well, shape would be called something different. But fundamentally, ideals correspond to, um, shapes. And again, I can be precise about this. So it's got to be a subset of, of a ring. So you have to have some sort of ambient space. Um, so in this case, the ambient space was, you know, you know, the ambient space was, uh, I guess, R2. Um, so, and then the ring, and then the ring was, you know, the two variable polynomials on R, uh, which is notated like this, R bracket X, Y. Um, so that would be R. And then it's got to be closed under addition. And then it's closed under multiplication by anything. Um, but again, like I said, for ring, a ring, really, it's something that acts like it's all of the functions on a space. and an ideal is something which acts like it's the functions on a subspace. Okay. Um, and then there's a theorem um, from a little bit before, you know, Grotendieck and Zariski and all of them, but uh, it's by Hilbert. Um, and so what this theorem says um, is up to taking powers. Um, the ideal of a shape completely determines it. So meaning like um, I can, you know, I can, you know, maybe square some functions, you know, I can square all of the functions in the ideal and it won't, it might not be the same ideal, um, but this is the only thing that can go wrong. Um, I consider all the possible functions that vanish and up to just taking powers, this completely determines what the shape is. So in this theorem um, has a, 
a quite fun name. It's the Null uh, Stellen Sots. Now, I think that this is supposed to be an A, but it might be an E. Um, well, that's a fun one to look up if you want to Google it. Um, and, and this is kind of one of the foundations of algebraic geometry, right? This is one of the things that um, it really a lot of other stuff is based on. Okay. And then, so the last thing that I want to say is there's this, um, there's this sort of, uh, uh, there's a sort of trick that you do to, um, to get, uh, what's, what's the word? So given my, say, two-dimensional space, I had my ring, which was all of the functions on that space. And an ideal corresponds to a subspace. But then what if I wanted, so, so that, that subspace, right? Maybe it's the circle. So now the, 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 the idea is what if I want to um, consider the, um, what if I want to consider all of the functions just on the subspace and consider that to be my ambient space? Um, and so, the, and, the, and so basically the way we do this is we are gonna just mod out by the ideal I, right? So the R mod I is gonna be all of the functions um, that are in R, uh, you know, but they're equivalent if the two functions you, you know, you know, A is equivalent to B if A equals, you know, B plus. B plus F for F and I, right? A standard sort of equivalence relation. And then the quotient um, will also be a ring and that will be the ring of all functions on S, the, the subspace, right? So if S is our, our subspace shape. Okay. So after all that, um, I guess, I guess, are there any quick questions before we go on to deformation theory? Okay, so after all of that sort of um, like talk about like what are shapes, now let's, let's talk about a geometric operation on shapes, which is deformation. So I think when I think of deformation, what I think of is um, I think of, you know, I have my shape and I'm gonna like poke it a little bit. And, you know, maybe, I don't know. I don't know how to say it without saying the word deform, right? I'm gonna deform the shape a little bit and I'm gonna get a new shape. So if I wanted to deform a point, I think, you know, what I would think of is, you know, like poking my point over a little bit. Um, and so, right, so like, you know, ah, oh, oh. Um, you know, you can know this, this could be like, you know, my thumb. I can't draw a hand, but I'm gonna poke the, I'm gonna poke the point a little bit and it's gonna move and somehow if, if we can somehow the deformation should be um, close um, together. And so, okay, so now let's reinterpret this picture in terms of our algebra. Um, so we, we always have R, the ring of functions on the ambient space. And so let's make, and so then I is going to be, you know, whatever the subspace is, the, so now let's say it's the ideal of a point maybe, or honestly, you know, we could say it's the ideal, of just some shape. Um, and so what a 
deformation is going to be for us, for just for the purposes of this talk, is we have this map um, R to R mod J, where J is a different point. So J is the ideal, a different point. And so, and so then we have, so we have these two functions um, right here. So we have the ambient space, which is like the sort of deformation space. So that's the space where the deforming is happening. And then we want to look at, um, somehow we want to look at um, the, the, um, the two sort of, um, points as being deformed somehow in the deformation space um, um, to, so this point is being deformed in the deformation space to the other one. Um, and so a quick note, if you've seen deformation theory before, um, you'll, you'll, you'll know that I'm fudging things a little bit and I'm hiding Normally there's another map here that I'm assuming is the identity um, because I want to, I, because I, I don't want to, well, I don't need to have it not be the identity because I'm just sort of doing this little point. Um, uh, I'm just deforming one point into another point. Um, but, but so, so this, but so the point is that this algebraic picture, right? Um, this, this picture of the deformation based on the stuff we just talked about looks like, I guess, this in the algebraic picture. Um, that's what a deformation is. Yeah. I'm not sure absolutely. It's like in this definition, like where is I showing up? Like why, where, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's, it, it feels like it's not right. And so this is the thing about the deformation is that the fact that I is showing up in this deformation is the fact that there exists this map right here from R to R mod I. And so this becomes more non-trivial when, um, when, when my map here is not zero because normally this will, will what, we like to, what we like to do is we like to say, Everyone, everyone always draws this picture where we have, you know, some parameter that we're deforming by, and then at each step, you know, there's some shape which, for some reason, is always is drawn as a torus, right? And the idea is that the whole space. Um, is R and then um, R mod I sort of exists as one of these, um, one of these uh, tori and then R mod J would be one of the other tori. Um, and so the interest in this is like a lot of times in algebraic geometry, you know, most of these most of these guys are isomorphic, but there's like a one maybe, or um, a, a quote unquote small set, a set of measure zero, if you will, um, of, of guys on this parameter where the thing is different. Um, and those different ones are somehow of interest. Um, does that help answer the question? Somewhat, I'm still confused. Like even in this example, like, so, okay. Like I is like one of the things J is another thing, but like, where's the connection? Like, where do you encode like this line that, that there are the traveling along? And I, I know it's yeah. not exactly. So it's, it's, it's the, the encoding of the line is just the fact that they're both inside R. They're, they're both inside the plane. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and so it's a little, it's a little weird because, um, it's a little weird because there isn't actually kind of a line in the definition. Um, 
and you know somehow somehow this is somehow drawing like some sort of path here um, would be quite hard in terms of um, um, in, in terms of of this language as opposed to say some other type of framework which uses more epsilons than 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 algebraic geometry would so if I go on maybe this will help so um, how, also, there's a question from a beak, which may be the same question, which is, um, is there any yeah, something? Yeah, so this is this. Yeah, so 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 the the answer is there is some. I think there is some condition. It's satisfied in this case um, because I chose some parameter to be the identity, um, and I don't want to think about what it is. Um, and so you know, how do we? So 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 I think part of what you both are asking is like. What is this? What this condition is here is like. How do we tell if these points are close, right? That would be another way of phrasing, uh, I think, Sam, Sam's question. And so again, the answer I'm giving is, well, nope. Um, so in my example, any of the points could be considered a deformation, even if it looks like it's very far away, and. Um, this is this is an artifact of the fact that in algebraic geometry, um, open balls or open neighborhoods uh, can be quite big um, in sort of the real life way of of how you would think about it. Um, but there are so if you if 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 you there there are ways there are there are sort of conditions that you can show one one of them uses something called the the dual numbers. Um, so if you if you want to um, if you want something to Google, you can Google like deformation theory and algebraic geometry and the dual numbers or something. Um, there are a couple of stack stack overflow posts. Um, so so yeah, so I'm kind of punting on this question because it's irrelevant for what I want to say um, right in a second here. Um, okay. Okay, so the last most exciting thing is there's another ring that we haven't talked about, and that's the ring of integers. And the ring of integers somehow is one of the most important and fundamental rings there are. Um, and what I've said when I define the ring of integers, or when I define a ring, is I'm just like the ring is something that should be the ring of functions on a space. And so the question is, what the heck is the space that Z is the ring of uh, functions for? And so to, to understand that, we wanna understand what the ideals are, right? And there's one ideal of Z for every natural number. And you, know, you just take, the ideal is just all the family of everything, of all of the multiples of that number. Um, and then, you know, what does the shape that that Z is going to look like? I, I don't, don't know if I'm going to be honest. Like, it, there's no way to picture it that I know of. Um, and what ends up happening when you study this this type of thing is that the prime numbers end up being very important because prime numbers are not unions of other shapes. Um, we might call them arithmetic shapes because we're talking about the integers. Um, and so the thing is, thinking about primes as subspaces or thinking about numbers as subspaces in, instead of as, um, instead of thinking about numbers as subspaces instead of just as numbers. Um, when people think this way, so this is sort of the foundation of arithmetic geometry and people call this the arithmetic direction. And so that's the title of my talk. That's sort of what this is. Um, what, what, and, and so what I wanna show you um, before we go here is how might, one, one, how might somebody try to deform something in the arithmetic direction? Okay, so just last week, um, due to work of many, including 
um, Ked Lai Liu, uh, Shulza, and uh, others before them who did special cases. Um, algebraic geometers now have a powerful tool, uh, which is a recipe for deforming a prime number p in the arithmetic direction. Um, and so the setting that this works in, I'm going to sort of throw under the rug. It works for rings that have, quote unquote, enough p roots in the ring. Um, such rings are called perfectoid rings. And the recipe is called the perfectoid correspondence. So here's a picture of it. What it's actually going to be is it's going to look like um, um, it's going to look just like our picture of the deformation of two points. We have R going to R mod I and to R mod J. And here we have the point that we started with. And here we have the different point. And so um, now I have some, you know, fancy notation here that some people uh, in the audience may recognize. So I have a ring here. So I have my ambient space um, right here, which is called W of A flat. And if you don't know what W of A flat is, um, great, that's good, it doesn't matter. This is just the ambient space. Um, and when you, when you quotient by uh, the ideal of P, um, that is gonna end up being uh, um, A flat. So, and then, so there's a standard recipe for obtaining uh, W of A flat from A flat. And so A flat is a ring in characteristic P. You know, we quotient it. Um, P is going to equal zero in this ring. And so A flat is going to be a ring characteristic P. And then what's going to happen. And, and so the deformation, what the deformation looks like, what the recipe, what this advance was, um, could Lion Yu and Schulze do is, is they're going to quotient um, this ambient space by something else, some other element D, uh, D is for distinguished, which is a name that doesn't describe anything about what D is probably because it's kind of, we kind of don't even really know exactly what a way to sort of picture this. Um, but the point is we're quotienting out by some different ideal and then we get some other ring over here that's characteristic equal to zero. And these rings have very similar properties and they, there's a, you know, there's some, you know, there's some more machinery that you can do to tell that these rings have the same, have, have the similar properties and that um, they, they, uh, right, um, what, what was I gonna say? They have similar properties and sort of geometrically they're, they're kind of the same, right? Um, and so what people do in, in what, what people will try and do is they'll use their understanding of this ring to study these rings. So they'll use their understanding of these rings uh, to study this ring. And this, this correspondence, that's the perfectoid correspondence. Um, okay. Um, so I guess it's 53. Am I out of time? If, if you want to go a little longer, I mean, we won't hold anyone. I, I mean, I, this is, this is where I was going to end. So yeah, um, then I guess this is a good place to end then. Um, yeah. So let's all, uh, mute yourself and, uh, thank or however you want to thank, uh, Jay. Um, great. Uh, are there any questions or comments for uh, Jason? Uh, any questions?
Um, all right, if there's uh, no further questions, uh, let's thank JJ once more. <laughs>